Simple as that. Too many people concentrate too much on the wrong things in photography. If I'm spending more time in Photoshop than I'm spending time <coughs> capturing photographs, I'm doing something wrong. Now I love Photoshop when I really want to do something. When I do something that I can't do in camera. However, most people, have, not most, that's a generalisation, lots of people have started to correct things rather than getting them right in camera. And this microphone's way too loud. Is it really loud out there? Yeah. Or just about right? We'll be, we'll be able to tell if people start walking after the scout anyway. So my whole workflow, my ethos on portraiture, headshots, anything that I do with photography, is to get it as right as I can with camera. It's also about being consistent and having a fast workflow. Just because, you know, I do this for a living, it's, it's to make money, it's not to have fun with, though it usually is fun when I'm shooting. The more time I spend doing things that I could have corrected at the capture point, the less money I make, because it reduces my hourly rate. You know, I'm also one of these strange photographers. You know, I, I deal with it, I can teach an awful lot of social photographers, so newborn photographers, family photographers, child portrait photographers, and most of them have forgotten this thing called a life. Because if you ever want to get a hold of a newborn photographer, the best time to find them is about 1 a.m., because they'll be editing. True story? Yeah. Yeah? Shouldn't be happening. Uh, the way my workflow works in my studio is, say I've got a 10 o'clock shoot, and I only shoot one a day, two at the most. I want to shoot till 12. I want to grab my sandwich while I download and back up. I want to edit till about 2 o'clock, and then I want to go home and pick my boy up from school. And then I can go home, and I know that today's work is done. When he goes to bed, I'll do a little bit of marketing or a little bit of posting on social media. But actually, my work is done. Yeah, I don't want to be sat up spending an hour. Who spends more, more than two hours editing a shoe? Will you do me a favour? Will you go and stand in that corner and have a little word with yourselves? Is it because it's creative edits or is it because you're not quite getting what you want in camera? So how long does it take to edit a wedding? Okay, that's good. That's good. It used to take me a week when I started to do a wedding. Now it takes me about three hours. So that's pretty good. Go on, you said you do. Do you use any actions or anything like that? Or portraiture or anything like that? Put more light into it. Put more light into the skin, you'll get less blemishes to see. Dead simple. Right, so my whole ethos is get it as right as I can in camera, less work to do afterwards, move on to the next shoot and get it sold. Done. A lot of studios I go to are, fill, are actually, some are smaller than this space. You know, and it is expensive to run a big studio. I've got a big, bigger studio. And it is expensive to run. If I was in the south of the country, I couldn't run the studio that I do. But because I'm in the frozen north where everything's cheap, it's okay. What I want to show you is a couple of quick setups, a one light and a triflection. We can get real quality portraiture straight out of the camera, even with those eyelashes. <laughs> totally, right? Last setup I did. So I have my beautiful young model here. And I go, right, I'm gonna go for butterfly lighting from the top. One of my favorite go-to setups that anybody that knows me know I do. And then I set it all up, and I'm just about to take the first picture. And I just discover, just do me a favor, just turn into profile. The world's longest tarantulas growing from these eyelashes on top. Now anybody that knows anything about lighting knows that butterfly lighting comes straight down. But then it stops at this whole herd of tarantulas and won't let any light come into the eyes. 
and I've got away with saying it twice and I haven't been hit. As soon as this microphone goes off, I'm getting it, I know I am. So I thought I'd go with a nice 45 degree lighting this time to start with, make it nice and easy. So one of the things that makes my workflow fast, and this is great for newborn photographers, is I grey coloured everything. Yeah? What this allows me to do is get correct skin tones on every setup. So again, if the skin tones are corrected every time and they come back to the same base neutral, it means that my workflow is consistent across skin tones. So if then this young lady decided to buy a beautiful multi-aperture frame, or a 9-up or something like that, I wouldn't have to go fixing that one that's a bit green, that one that's a bit orange, that one that's a bit yellow and make them all match, because they're already consistent. And all it requires is that I take a picture of it with my light itself. Simple as that. So I do that on every setup. The other thing I do, I started photography 12 years ago, when I was young. So, digital. I used to do some landscape stuff in the lakes before that. But one of the first things that I really learnt about was using one of these. Yeah? Who trusts the back of the camera? Before I ask the question, who trusted the back of the camera? Yeah? Who trusts the histogram? We well, either do or you don't. It's not like, you know. So you were a bit. Why do you trust it? Because it's, it gives you the same data you get. Does it? Okay, good point, but no, it doesn't. The reason it doesn't, what camera do you shoot? Could have been worse, could have been Fuji. But anyway, um, your camera can't read its own raw files. So all it's getting, it's getting all its information from the JPEG. And even if your JPEG is set to its most neutral setting, it's applying processing, it's adding contrast, sharpness, saturation, all of that, which will manipulate your histogram. So it's a ballpark figure. Have you ever taken a shot on the back of the camera and thought, yes, got that? Loaded it up into your raw software and then it goes flat. Yeah? That's your JPEG being taken out. So it's just something to think about. I don't trust my camera. I trust my screen if I'm shooting tethered. But I trust this more than anything. This is my measuring jug. And all it does is tell me how much light is coming out of my light. So I decide the f-stop I want to shoot at. And I test it. And if it's too much, I turn it down. If it's not enough, turn it up. It ain't rocket science. But I do it all the time. And particularly if I'm doing multiple light setups, which I'm not going to do today, it allows me to control the ratios of each light to each other to a tenth of a stop, okay? So by doing that, did you know that if you, even if you have a correct grey carded skin tone across the whole gallery, if you have an inconsistency in exposure, those skin tones will look different because of saturation. The more light you put onto a subject, the less saturated it becomes. So if I take that red, cherry red backdrop there, and I blasted it with light, it would go past them. If I let hardly any light hit it, it will become really deep, almost crimson. It's called chroma. That's what that is. So if I don't get consistent exposure and consistent grey carding, colour temperature, I'm not going to get consistent skin tones. And I'm one of those that actually wants that, because that proves that I'm a portrait photographer and not just capturing what I see. So anyway, we're going to do a 45 degree setup, nice and simple. Oh, you've changed. Or as you would know, you've changed. So with this, all the lighting setups relate to the position of the nose to the light. Because that creates the pattern. And one of the things that I teach people is, don't look for the light, look for the shadow. Because when the shadow is in the right place, the light is right. Okay? So I'm going to do 45 degree light, so I'm going to slip this light forward. I'm not sure, have you moved your foot to that? I'll put it there then. So bad. So bad, man. 
So I've got this light, it's a 135 octobox. Anything over a meter, the bottom of it, if you can, aim to be at shoulder height. Because light always comes down. Too many people on the soft boxes like this. Right? We used to see shadows coming I can't see all that. We used to see shadows coming down because we've got top lights, sun in the sky. So we're used to seeing shadows coming down. When they don't come down and go across, we won't understand perhaps always why it looks wrong, but we all know that it doesn't look. So always work on that light comes down. And anybody who tells you otherwise is wrong. My girlfriend got me a t-shirt, it says on it, I may be wrong, but it's highly unlikely. You know, I don't stand here and tell you things if they're not right. I genuinely do. So we want it level, roughly, with the top of the shoulders. It's around about there, the bottom of the softbox. That puts the flash tube about 50 centimetres above the head so the shadows don't come down. So I've got it, I'm going to actually, because you're so slender, I'm going to break the rules. I'm going to turn you into the light. So just turn, forward. yep, just like so. Normally you would turn a feminine subject away from the light and put anything that was lumpy bumpy into shadow. But because you're so slender, I want to accentuate those curves and make it look shapely. You are shapely, but I've just noticed out of reach, I can say things. And then I'm always going to bring the head back towards camera. Yeah. Now if you look, this light is at 90 degrees to the nose. Agree? Coming out here, aiming towards me, 90 degrees to the nose. But I've said it's 45 degree light. And the reason it is, is because there's a gap between the edge of the softbox and the nose. If I was to step you forward without you falling over that cable, that would be 90 degree light. Because it's coming straight across here. A little bit of feather off this edge, but not much. And I would create split lighting, which is not what I want. So if I get it to just step back without falling over that cable, you see why I use battery light. Just turn a bit further. Perfect. So now, We've got that 90 degree angle, but the light that's coming out is at 45 degrees. And that's what I'm looking for, that 40 to 45 degrees, that classic Rembrandt lighting. I can already see, even here, that I'm going to get a triangle of light there. That's what I'm looking for. So I take my trusty light meter. Now this is a Pro Fabric Conker's backdrop. It's textured. If I shot this at f16, it be beautifully in focus here, and here, and here, and here, and that texture will ping out. I don't want that, I want a soft old master's feel to this. So I'm going to shoot this about f4. So I've decided I want f4. So I'll do a quick light check. I've got just under f8, so my light is too bright. So I'm going to turn it down. Good guess, it was close, point one of a stop. F4, exact. So 120 foot, now I decide the ISO, which from what I try and do where possible if I've got enough light, I'm always going to shoot the native ISO of my camera. In Canon it used to be 160 on the 5D Mark IV and stuff like that, which is a silly number. Nikon used to be 200. I know that from the like 800 series onwards it dropped to 100, but for my Sony it's 100. So I've got F4, ISO 100, my six speeds up to 200, but rather than making sure that my batteries are always charged, I always give myself a margin of error and shoot 125th of a second. Okay, so they're the settings I put on my camera. Come all the way back here. Okay, swap legs. No, no, stay turned that way. Weight goes onto the foot furthest from the camera. The one that's nearest comes up on your toe and just points towards me. There we go. This hand is just going to sit onto this tire. Hang it. And just rotate slightly. And then the other one's just going to fall naturally. Just bring your shoulders around a touch. Chin around to me. Delicate little tip on the head. Little smile. Chin. Perfect. 
So this isn't a half inch shot, but it still proves the fee. Because it makes people concentrate. So, F4. Into my camera. Get a focus. 3, 2, 1. I think I may have chopped a finger there. There we go. So what I'm seeing here is I'm getting that Rembrandt triangle. I'm getting a nice wrap around the light and the exposure on the highlights is correct. But I've got a big sucky black wall here. And all that's doing is it's killing any bounce or any feedback or any separation that's going to come from that bounce in here. Black subtracts, white reflects. So what I'm going to do is, while it's technically correct, the shadows are too dense. So it's not giving me that feminine ratio that I want in the portrait. So, slightly loud, that feedback. So I'm going to take my trusty triflection. Try not to bash you with it. And I'm going to turn it on its side. Before I do that, I'm just going to straighten this panel. Because it's got the multi mount bracket, I can turn it delicately without breaking myself onto its side. And now I've got it on its side, I can manipulate it into the angles I want to give me that little kick of light back. Now sometimes you haven't got room in the studio to set up, set up a second light but by using this I create a secondary light source. I'm going to treat you. There you go. You touch, the, touch the baby. So I'm going to use the reflector, the triflection, to just give me a little kickback of light, lift that shadow density, and just give me more correct ratios. So, same again. Turn that way. Foot towards me. Hand sits onto the thigh, a little bit higher. Now, if I had a more curvaceous subject, somebody with a little more weight, then I would ask you to bring your elbow towards me, touch, now keep the hand where it is, up, rotate, elbow out, don't move your hand, don't move your shoulder, just move your elbow, elbow, hey, we got there in the end, didn't we, probably have a round of applause that she's found her elbow, <laughs> on the other hand, just sits on the thigh, chin comes round to me, too far, top of the head, just a gentle tilt, a little delicate smile. It's one of anger that's going to get me in a lot of trouble when you guys have gone. Get my focus. Three, two, one. And the triflection has opened up that shadow detail. You've got much better light on the face and control all those shadows. And that is a face that tells me I'm really in trouble when this whole demo is over with. So I'll just keep talking to about seven o'clock then, shall I? will be all right. So that's a quick way of using it in the vertical orientation to give me just that opportunity to lift the shadows. Now, most people with smaller studios make the mistake of painting them all white. So you end up with no control over your light. As much as this killed the light, I would take that all day long over a white studio because I can control my densities with this or a fill light behind camera. What I can't do is in a white box very easily stop it bouncing. So I would go for that dark studio. So that's one orientation for that and it gives a nice light. I'm going to keep this, just bring it forward a little bit and I'm going to switch the triflection into its normal position as such. If 
I had a bit more time, I'd switch that softbox into a top light, but in this space, with Navina sat there, it may end up in a dying, trying to do it. So I'll do this instead. And again, just showing that you can use this triflexion in so many different ways, I'm just going to use it as two panels. So if I left it as it is, without this, we'd get that dark one that we got before. But I'm going to use this panel and literally drop it out of the way. So it's totally out of the way. Don't need it. So I'm going to bring this into here. I'm going to bring it nice and close. I'm going to get it to turn that way. I'm going to get it to turn that arm under your bus line. This arm's going to come. Now this will, we'll see, see how good you are now. So that goes under there like that. This goes like this. Thumb. Inside the bicep. Heel of the hand comes to the crook of the elbow. And the fingers just gently cascade. Perfect. It's a very serious face. You're trying not to laugh. Just spend time with me, you'll never laugh. Just like so. So I can see already that I've got that beautiful catch light coming in and that little sparkle to the face. Don't need that because my light's doing it. So this comes in, get that position where I want it. Thank you. Take my trusty camera. Come all the way back here. Just give me a drop on this shoulder. A bit more. And then turn around to me a touch more. Jump on the head very slight. Get that little smile. Now that's a really little smile. There we go. And I'll get that lovely wrap around the light. Now I've discovered that this TV is incredibly contrasty and shows very little of the actual light you get on the shot. So there it's just wrapping around and giving me a much better light and separation than it shows on there. I also feel, because I've moved the back just a fraction, that I'm probably about a third of a stop underexposed. Because what I should have done was re -meter it. And I've always put my meter safe. The biggest mistake I have in my studio is half my chairs are black. And I'll put my camera down and spend the next five minutes saying, hunt the camera. Come back. I'm really sorry, I'm traumatising you so much for this. Oh, what did I say I lost about a third of a stop? Four tenths. Not a bad guess, was it? Schoolboy error. Exact. So now I'm going to get a really nice headshot. Well, I'll do my best. Again, just turn in. Can we take this hair around to this side? Oh no, we'll go the other way. Is that alright? Just bring your shoulder around. Bring your chin around to me. Head tilt. Touch more. Perfect. I really don't like this TV. It's totally destroying pictures. Tilt. Now you can see how it brings that sparkle into the eyes, lifts it all and gives us a nice simple but effective portrait. And that's bizarre because even at 105mm I see distortion in that image. Because I normally shoot my headshots at 135 and even at that I'm seeing that little hint of distortion in the image. So I'm going to do one more from a little further away. So let's have that beautiful smile that you're so happy to be here with me for. Chin. There we go. Fab. Awesome. So there you go. Simple, easy portraiture. The one thing I haven't done though, that nobody's remind me, 
is to do my grey card. But it doesn't matter if I do it at the start or the end, as long as I do it under the setup. Now, I haven't asked you to pull a face all the way through this, but this is our last shot. So you've got to do your best. Three, two, one. Class. It happens every time. And do you know what? That's the one that will be on Facebook before she goes home. It doesn't just bad. But it's just simple and particularly for those that don't have big spaces or don't want to carry a lot of kit, the triflexion makes a one light into four light sources. You can take them off and use an individual panel and all of the above will just give you more direction with your portraiture without carrying around 57 lights. Anybody got any questions? Dark grey. Control is so hard. Cool, no more. Can I say a wonderful thank you to our beautiful model. She's managed to survive three sessions with me today without hitting me. Later. Um, if you haven't got any more questions, go and buy Triflection, make Charlie happy, and even more so, get a backdrop at the same time. Well, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the show.